one week left for the preseason. And as we have one week left for the preseason, so what is your biggest point of concern as this team heads into the regular season? Uh, banged up big guys on both sides of the line. Yeah, that, that uh, I'm not sure there's any other direction to go with that. Welcome in. We're back in Jacks. I'm Penani Stevens here for Jags AM. Brian Sexton, John Osier. After our beautiful week in Michigan, we're back in the lovely state of Florida as we get ready to wrap up this first section or last section, I should say, of training camp. And then we head into the regular season. So we got to see some game action this week, if you want to call it that. Um, more action probably in those joint practices. Yeah, although I will say this, you know, calling the game on television, it was, it was pretty good. I mean, relatively speaking, a preseason game featuring nothing but twos, threes, and some fours can generally be easily predicted to be less than stellar. Uh, But it was an entertaining game, and we saw some young guys do some things. I mean, on the first snap of the game, Caleb Von Chason, who we've been talking about, we got to see something. Well, we saw the pass rush, right, that set up Jeremiah Ledbetter for the sack. Should have got the sack himself. But there were moments like that. Tim Jones over the shoulder catch. We'll talk about all of them probably over the course of the next half hour. But it was pretty entertaining for a preseason game. Yeah, I mean, I think the theme of this show will be injuries. Uh, the second part of the theme, which I think is a different theme than last year, is uh, depth. It it looks like, at least in the short term, the Jaguars have the depth to withstand this injury issue we're talking about. Uh, that's interesting. That's our big thing, number one. We are going to discuss those injuries. Best laid plans. We came into the season thinking that, you know, this team was very deep in certain sections of the roster, wide receiver, offensive line, and specifically the offensive line suffered several injuries, mostly to the backups um, that were playing in the game in preseason game two. But there's some concern there, right? We have, you know, a handful of names. Is there a specific injury that concerns you the most, Brian? Oh, wow. That's a good one. Uh, Probably the shoulder of uh, Anton Harrison, although the word is that it's an injury that you play with. It's more pain management through the course of the year. But because Cam is going to be down for four Mm -hmm. games, um, Walker Little can't slide over and step in and play right tackle. And I guess if you wanted to take that a step further, Josh Wells, because Josh Wells was going to be that veteran third swing tackle in camp in case someone gets banged up while Cam is down early in the season, and, and now you don't have him. So I, Harrison first, well second. Yeah, those are the two. And if it stops now and they sort of get this thing settled, uh, I think they're okay. I, I, I don't have a feel for whether Harrison will play this week. I wondered last week if they might not, you know, as much as you would love to have him get one more half of reps, you wonder. I don't know the nature of the shoulder injury to know enough that if, if – if they didn't have him in contact for three weeks, if, if that would help significantly. Because every time he's been on the field so far, he's impressed. Yeah. So you get the idea that they might be said, okay, well, let's just assume that he's going to continue to impress. He'll be a rookie. But is the benefit of playing him for 12 snaps on Saturday outweigh maybe getting him rest until, what, September 7th, or, you know, whenever the opener is. It's the 10th, so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, In that sense, I would put Josh Wells at the top. The other guys who got injured uh, are mainly depth. I I didn't want to see Cooper Hodges get hurt. No, but I don't think he. I don't think the team plans for him to be a big factor in September. So if he can get back by October and be depth, I think you're okay there. I think Wells is the one that uh, really sort of was a gut punch. Yeah, because you felt almost like, well, that's something I don't have to worry about. Whatever reps, he's ten years. He's going to be what he is. And then all of a sudden he's limping around, and uh, that's not good. Here's an important part of it. And then, of course, the one that everyone's wondering about, the statement that was released yesterday by the Jaguars, is Devon Hamilton. The coach addressed it this morning. They just don't know, right? And yeah. so that's one that we're just going to have to kind of wait and watch. Yeah, we were talking offensive line. Uh, to me, that's the biggest one so far uh, because you feel like you have a general idea of Harrison. You don't know with Hamilton, yeah. and he's really important to the defensive end. And he was really good in, in Dallas, so you hope for that one too. I'll list off some of the details for our viewers just because Devon Hamilton, we've heard, is a back injury. It was non-football related, so they're not going to comment on that any further until he's back in the building working with the team. Um, in terms of the offensive line, 
Blake Hance will be available. I think he was in. He was. They thought he was in concussion yeah, protocol. He's concussion. not. That was that came from the He's spotter. So he'll today. practice. He'll be fine. Um, Shatley is still out dealing with his um, heart issue. It's supposed to be out for another week, Doug said. So that's uh, sort of next week we might get a better idea. We'll get a better idea if he's going to be back with the team. Anton Harrison dealing with that shoulder injury, but he looked fine against Aiden Hutchinson all week last sure. week. And he's more playing than fine. With yeah. More than fine. So he's playing through that very well. Josh Wells, we're hearing, I think it's a groin injury. They don't have a timeline on that. Could be out for quite some time, at least from what we heard from Doug so far. And there's definitely some other people I'm missing because I know there's a Chandler lot. Chandler Brewer was concussion protocol. And Antonio Johnson was a hamstring? Yeah. Yes, Antonio Johnson was a hamstring. He's going to be out for at least a couple of weeks, at least from what we've heard so far. And then and reserve then, offensive lineman Daryl Williams uh, played through a, had a shoulder. shoulder. He played through it. So, and, and then I think what Doug was most optimistic about today, through all that, they get Ben Barch back this week, which— That's really important if now. That, if, if no other injuries, then you basically go into the— into the season with your offensive line healthy as you thought it would be since you knew about the Cam Robinicks. You bet. Uh, I suspension. you'd have Little on the left, Anton Harrison on the right, the Barge and Sheriff guard and Fortner center. That's your starters. And then you just sort of hold your breath until these other guys sort of come back and, you know, provide your depth. All right, big thing number two is a numbers game. We're getting down to that point where they're going to have to cut down this roster very soon to 53. And since they only do one big cut now, it's a little bit different than years before where you maybe weed some people out. When they make that big decision, a lot of these skill positions, there is an overload, specifically wide receiver. Does the math work out for everybody? And then also running backs, how many are they going to keep? Where Do you have any inkling, either of you, direction um, of which way they might go with that? Here, here's the interesting rub to this, John, um, is – if you have to keep an extra offensive lineman right now, what to cover, does yeah. right because of all the injuries? What does that do? You're going to keep six receivers, but do you still keep four tight ends? Can you keep all four running backs that you like, or does that offensive line issue start to create some downflow that impacts your roster? Yeah, and then and then there become guys where you think, well, we like this guy very much. Is another team going to like him enough to bring him in? over guys that they have gotten, you know, that they've developed crushes on, so to speak, during their offseason. Uh, when, I, when I say that, I think of Garrett Prince, for example. Yeah. I think, I think this team really, really likes Garrett Prince. If it's a numbers game, could they think, well, it, if we try to get him through to the practice squad, will anybody else like him enough, or do, or do we just like him? And, and I'm not really singling out him. He's a name that pops no. up in my mind. But you know the uh, best example of that? In 2014, they had a rookie undrafted offensive lineman named Tyler Shatley, and they loved him, right? And they were going to try to pass him through and get him to the practice squad because he wasn't ready to play. Mm -hmm. And yet they heard from folks. Well, they started getting calls about trading yeah. for him, I think. Yeah, and, and yeah that was it. So, and they realized they couldn't do it. Yeah, so that uh, they anticipate – uh, this not being a solvable problem, meaning they anticipate that they're going to choose their 53, release guys, and then two or three guys are going to get picked up. And at, as Doug said, it, it was kind of funny the way he said it, and it was, it was a couple weeks ago. So it's a good problem to have. And he said, well, it is if you make the right decisions, but you got to make sure that the guys you keep are the right guys because sometimes you release guys and you know make the wrong decision there. So it's... Yes, it's a good problem to have the depth, but you don't want to be releasing the next, you know, whoever. We'll get to that in a little bit. We're going to talk specifically about those wide receivers because I think that's still definitely a spot that's up for grabs. Our last big thing, though, is untouchables. Now, we're talking a little bit about that 53-man roster. Got us thinking, obviously. You know, Trevor Lawrence, totally untouchable. But who else on this roster do you look at and you go, if that person is lost for the season, then this significantly affects what the record of this team could be and what the success of this team could be. Brian, did you have anyone in mind if you think about I Obviously, yeah. Trevor's out, we're out. Yeah, but. Walker Little, right? Uh, I think Walker Little is such a linchpin in the offensive line because he can play left tackle, he can play left guard. Doug said this morning on his, his call that he thought he played really well for his first professional action inside. And, and obviously, with Anton Harrison in the shoulder, you know, if it's a pain management issue, there's going to be some moments where he, you, know, you might have to move him around. Walker is so valuable to this offensive line that if you lose a player like that, I mean, we're talking about Josh Wells, a 10-year veteran who was brought here to be a swing tackle, and that being a blow right now. I think in the regular season, Walker Little is that guy who'll create a downflow that will really thin you out quickly. Yeah, I, 
I don't want to lose Calvin Ridley because I really think his uh, dynamic element is going to add a lot. But if you did, you still feel okay about how you're lining up there. Yeah. And they were effective offensively without him. So they, I think they could get by. I would point on defense, I still say, and people disagree with me, Josh Allen's the one guy that I do not want to lose because whatever his sack numbers are, when you lose him, all of a sudden you're looking around to figure out where you're going to get him yeah. again. And, and but, but maybe the biggest one, and I'm going with like 18 guys here, <laughs> um, Tyson Campbell, if he goes down, Who uh, him? to me it's Tyson and the rest. I don't know that there's a guy in that rest oh. who can get to his level. Uh, th that would be a blow in terms of how they line up defensively. And just to touch on the Allen point, Allen was fifth or sixth in the league with a, a pass rush percentage greater than 15%, right? Which means that he was constantly the guy that was, even mm -hmm. if he wasn't getting to the quarterback, he was bothering the quarterback. You've got to have that guy. I think you're right. I think he's critical. And he's really, really good against the run. Yeah. And I know everybody, well, it's supposed to be an edge rush. I get that. But you don't want to not be good against the run yeah. because then teams don't have to pass. And he's even more than a cleanup guy. It, it, there's a lot of plays he makes that might be five-yard runs, and he makes them three-yard runs. And those two yards and down a distance, uh, he's really important on, on, on little things like that. He makes them much stouter, Kai. All right, coming up, we're going to go over the game film. We had preseason game two in Detroit last week, so we'll go over some of our highlights from that. Stay with us. Jaguars fans, huddle up for the best defense against expensive car repairs, CarShield. Score big with the nation's number one automotive protection company, CarShield. They offer affordable plans that cover over 6,000 parts and systems in your car, truck, or SUV. Don't miss any Jaguars action this season with a car breakdown. Call the MVPs at CarShield for their best coverage ever. Call 800-471-1223. 800-471-1223. Go Jags! Since 2014, there's been only one official home builder of the Jaguars, DreamFinders Homes. With quality built homes and a speedy move-in process, we're in 20 plus communities in the best locations across Northeast Florida. DreamFinders Homes is everywhere you want to live. So get off the sidelines, Jags fans, and get into the game. Let DreamFinders help you navigate your home purchase and offer great interest rates. Visit DreamFindersHomes.com for all your move-in ready homes and step up your game. Frank Frangie here. When you want barbecue in Jacksonville, you want Bono's Pit Barbecue. You can find Bono's locations all around town and on game day at Everbank Stadium because Bono's is the official barbecue of the Jacksonville Jaguars. Over 70 years of authentic Southern Pit Barbecue, we are the local barbecue joint in bbq Vol for generations of people in Jacksonville. Go to Bono'sBarbecue.com to learn more or call 904-880-8310 today. And remember, if you don't see a pit, it ain't legit. Jags AM is presented by Car Shield. You can call Car Shield now if your car is out of manufacturer's warranty. Do not get stuck with expensive mechanical and computer repairs. Call Car Shield now. We're back here in the Hyundai Studios after a week away in Michigan for practices with the Lions. And now we get ready for that final preseason game on Saturday against the Dolphins. But first, we're going to recap some of the action against the Lions. Now, we didn't see any of the starters except for Walker Little um, playing at guard. But other than that, we saw a lot of the young guys, which is what we needed to see. And those are the people that need to make an impression in game two if you want to have, uh, you know, make the roster. So, And I think there were a lot of guys that had positive um, impressions. One, and I think you mentioned him earlier, and, and now what he's really needed is Jeremiah Ledbetter, right? Yes. He, he flashed all over the second half and uh, in Dallas. And then again in the first half here the other night. And including the first play of the game, I he, believe. He came out strong and finished off Caleb Von Chase on you know, missed sack opportunity. They're going to need that big guy uh, if Devon Hamilton is not ready to go at the start of the season. And yeah, he, Fo Foley's injury as well, we should mention. He's part of my sizzling hot take Ooh. later on. And, and it's it's so hot, I can barely stand it right okay. now. Um, but this doesn't always mean everything. But I think Jaguars fans who really follow this team closely and, and who even live and die during the preseason will sort of uh, 
related to what I'm talking about. Boy, that preseason game was nice the other night because it looked like the entire Jaguars roster, depth-wise, was better than the Lions roster. It did. And it, that doesn't always mean that that's the case, if you follow me. Like, I thought last year the depth panic about this team was way overblown because I, I thought they had depth in some really key situations. But Jaguars fans have sat around a lot of second-half preseason games and watched their teams get rolled because the lines were not as good as the other team's lines. That didn't look like the case the other day. I think it was 399 to 131. You know, again, doesn't always – that's not always a declarative statement on how good you are. Because there's no it, game planning going It's on. never a bad thing to have the guys look like they did the other night in the second half. So I thought that was pretty cool. Or the other day. Let's talk a little bit about the running backs, too. We saw some extended carries from Tank Bigsby, who has impressed me, at least. He's really solidified his position here and what the role he's going to play on this team. And then also, Dearness Johnson had some good runs. So I was impressed with at least from the running backs we saw. And that we saw there's a lot on the roster, but I think some differentiated themselves. Johnson's a different style of runner. He's more that uh, third down back, right? He can, he can touch the swing pass. He can get around the corner. He showed us on the 17-yard touchdown the ability to get around the corner. But I was really impressed with Johnson's touchdown run mm -hmm. up the middle. He, set, him, he yeah. set himself up too for as he bounced outside before that. There's but. the outside run. Yeah, I like Johnson. I think he's been overlooked because there's just so many storylines on this team. But uh, again, I always hate to make declarative statements on the preseason, but Bigsby looks like he can really run. Yeah. He, he, he's His feet in the hole are impressive. The way he sets up the run are impressive. Uh, he's he also a, patient. Yeah, he has a calmness about him and the ability to accelerate. Um, we've been saying for a couple of weeks on this show that you kept hearing in the off season after the draft that they sort of thought maybe they really found something in this kid. Yeah. Uh, and it looks like he could explode. Running backs coach Bernie Parmalee told me early in camp that when he went to the tape and started evaluating these guys, this was the guy mm -hmm. that he wanted the most. Yeah, he thinks... And talking to Burnley, he thinks this kid might be special. Yeah. And I think when you also look at this, this is baseline. He has not even played a regular season game yet, and we're impressed with what he's been able to do. I'm excited to see kind of what evolves of this, especially with so much attention on the passing game. Might open some stuff up for him. Uh, also, we'd be remiss if we did not talk about the wide receivers because we discussed that last week, kind of. We each had our own person, but... Who's going to be getting that final wide receiver spot? We have most of them carved out. I think we gave Parker Washington technically the fifth person on our list, not necessarily the five, but who's going to be that other guy? Well, so I shared this because Doug told me during our preseason uh, telecast production meeting that this guy's going to be the fifth and that Parker Washington is slotted for the sixth. So these guys, Jacob Harris, Tim Jones, uh, Kevin Austin Jr., and um, Seth Williams. Cooks. Uh, he didn't mention Elijah Cooks. He said those were the four guys that he talked about, John. He said those guys have to block a safety. They're going to be in in running situations, and you got to block the safety. I, I couldn't watch the game close enough the other night to see who blocked the best. Um, but if you're asking me right now, I'll take Seth Williams because I think he is a well-rounded special teamer, blocker, and he made clutch catches in both of the two preseason games on third down and long. Yeah, I'd still be a little surprised if the kid we just saw, Tim Jones, isn't the guy. Because he was so good on special teams. He seems to get it. He makes plays when given the chance uh, for the football right here. So I'll go with him, but I, I'm not banging the table. I think uh, out of that, that bunch, obviously one of those guys is going to make the roster. I, the, they'll probably just have to take the approach of we're going to release three or four receivers and hope like heck that one or two of them don't get signed somewhere and we can get them back and feel like we can manage that situation and an injury might allow one of them to be on the team. You know, you don't hope for an injury. Right. But once you get them on the practice squad, sometimes what happens is other spots get injured and you can bring a guy up and keep him around your team for the long term, turning a – short-term negative into a long-term positive the interesting thing about harris and then cooks who i think is i like harris yeah, boy. yeah i do too is is that they are so distinctly different than any of the receivers you have they're taller they're both over six foot five they have immense wingspan i mean their arms stretch from sideline to sideline and both of them had made catches on the run 
which isn't as easy for those big bodies to then turn up the field, right? They can make the jumping catch. Sometimes, like Harris in Dallas made the diving mm-hmm. catch, but the catch and run like Cooks made the other day, for a big body like that to turn his hips and get up the field, that's not as easy to do as it looks. And I think that's part of why I don't think some of these wide receivers that don't make the final roster are going to be available for a practice squad. I think a lot of other teams are are very needy for position players or you know tall receivers, whatever yeah. it may be. So I don't think there's going to be a chance that a lot of those end up back here on the practice squad. But yeah, the only X factor, and I think you're right. But then, like I said earlier in the show, sometimes teams like keeping the guys around who know their scheme. Yes. So sometimes there's not quite as much movement on that deadline as you would think because if it's if it's just marginal between say a Jacob Harris and some receiver in you know Kansas City or whatever, uh, the other team might say, well, yeah, we like that guy, but this guy knows our system; he's yeah. been around. So you sort of hope that that plays into your favor a little bit, and you can keep some practice squad guys, but they're going to lose a couple. Well, here's the interesting thing. I mean. We didn't even mention. We mentioned Austin. We mentioned Harris. We mentioned Cooks. We mentioned uh, Tim Jones. Uh, Jeray Jenkins has been impressive on the practice field, and I'm told is improving as a special teams guy. I mean, it, it's not just three and or Kendrick four. Kendrick Pryor, guys. who was on the roster the yeah, whole year, year, we haven't even mentioned. Yeah. He was on the roster for a reason. Yeah. Because they, they felt like he was an NFL player who could step up if there was an injury. The amazing thing about that wide receiver core last year is you had Austin and Pryor None of them ever got a shot right. because the wide receiver. Let's hope it stays that way. Yeah, it's ridiculously deep. All right. Now let's take a look at Gregory Jr. He had an amazing game one of the preseason. And Doug talked a lot about seeing consistency out of those young defensive players. And that's exactly what we saw in game two. He was involved in a lot of stuff, had his pick, of course, here. And I mean, he's doing all the right things at this point. Do you think he can carve himself out a starting position if this keeps up? Yes. I do. I've been told that he, he it's closer than people think. Mm-hmm. He's a bigger, stronger, more physical, young presence. Uh, nothing against Trey. Trey's been here since 2018, and he has earned a spot in this. Here's the other thing, too. And, John, it's a factor. He's much less expensive. Mm-hmm. And this is a team that has to watch every penny heading into next year. And if you have the chance to take a young Greg Jr. who's playing well and have him for the next couple of years at a really fixed cost— it's much easier than a veteran player who's making over a, a, min, a million in that veteran minimum because every dime's going to count if you want to keep Calvin Ridley. If Josh Allen has a big season and you want to find a way to get him, you got Tyson Campbell, you've got the quarterback. So that factors into this decision at that nickel corner. Yeah, don't forget about Walker Little either. Um, um, yeah, this, I won't. So, so, uh, it's money. Yeah, it, it, there's no question to me Greg Jr.'s on the roster. The only question is whether he uh, gets that nickel spot. I don't know that it would necessarily be the either or scenario in, in terms of money this year, but I think you definitely keep Greg Jr. with the idea that bare minimum he can be a nickel going forward. And with Darius Williams next year, I, can Greg Jr. show enough to eventually be a starting outside corner? I don't know that he's done that yet. I asked him after the game, I, you know, uh, I said, you almost got to catch that one, right? And he, he laughed. He said, "Yeah, if I'd have dropped that, it would have been bad." Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's in absolutely. Film and me, but but he's he's on the fifty-three. There's a no knack doubt. for being around the ball. Uh, coaches don't like to get rid of that knack. Nope. Love to see it. All right, stay with us. We've got some piping hot takes coming up after the break. See you then. Jaguars fans, huddle up for the best defense against expensive car repairs, CarShield. Score big with the nation's number one automotive protection company, CarShield. They offer affordable plans that cover over 6,000 parts and systems in your car, truck, or SUV. Don't miss any Jaguars action this season with the car breakdown. Call the MVPs at CarShield for the best coverage ever. Call 800-471-1223. 800-471-1223. Go Jags! Your hometown gate now has more ways to save. Introducing My Gate Rewards, a new loyalty program with member exclusive savings and fuel discounts. Earn points on in store purchases, take advantage of special offers, and save on products you love. Score free coffee, fountain drinks, pizza, and soft serve with Gate's frequent shopper clubs. Then use your points on savings at the pump. Download the My Gate Rewards app in the App Store today or ask a store associate for more information. Go from good to gate. 
Since 2014, there's been only one official home builder of the Jaguars, DreamFinders Homes. With quality built homes and a speedy move in process, we're in 20 plus communities in the best locations across Northeast Florida. DreamFinders Homes is everywhere you want to live. So get off the sidelines, Jags fans, and get into the game. Let DreamFinders help you navigate your home purchase and offer great interest rates. Visit DreamFindersHomes.com for all your move in ready homes and step up your game. Move the freight, move the freight. Magellan Transport was voted the coolest office space in Jacksonville. You can apply online at www.magellanlogistics.com. Well, wrapping up training camp, wrapping up the preseason. So we got some hot takes for you. Why not? Brian, you want to start us off? Yeah, for sure. Uh, Nathan Rourke might be your three. And I say that because everybody is up in arms about this young kid for some of the dramatic plays that he's made. So rather than just throw that take out, I went and I talked to some coaches and scouting types while we were in Detroit. So most of them Jacksonville people, but some Detroit people too. And they pointed out a couple of things that I wanted to share. The first is, is that in the preseason, this guy said to me, just watch a preseason game. In the fourth quarter of a preseason game, if a quarterback has any juice at all, and this kid does, playing behind a line filled with guys who are going to be doing something different after final cutdown day, against guys who are rushing the passer who are going to be doing different things after cutdown day. Any quarterback with some juice has the ability to make plays. Now, his play in Dallas was legitimately a great play. Um, but I watched that very night, the Philadelphia-Cleveland game, and there was a quarterback who spun, twisted, turned, was knocked three times, got up, avoided the safety, and got up the field for what turned out to be a six-yard game, right? So you're going to see the juice. Number two, and this was pointed out by several people, and that is is that you have... Now, how much have we talked about the value of season two in Doug's system for the starter? Same thing for C.J. Beathard behind him. Now we've got a kid who's been here, what, a little over two months? You're not going to turn the reins over to that kid yet because you have a veteran backup who's very good in the room, I'm told, with Trevor. They're very close. You're not going to disrupt that. And the Jaguars, as Doug pointed out in his post-game news conference the other night, aren't even considering it. It's Beathard's job. That's what that means to him. And here's the last one. And I thought it was valuable, John. Um, People have to understand their role. And he has to come in here and embrace being the three. Not everyone wants to be told they're the three, but there's such a learning curve in the NFL that good twos are often good threes. They come in and they run the scout team. They learn the offense. They pay attention in meetings. They watch Trevor Lawrence, who's a legitimate elite quarterback in this league, and they grow from that. Folks, keep in mind, he's coming from Canada. And he's making an adjustment back to American football, where he played college football at Ohio. And there's a learning curve for everyone. He's not ready. He's athletic. He's exciting. He's got juice. If he'll embrace his role as the three here, he'll have a good chance to be a two at some point in the future. John, is there any chance they carry three quarterbacks? Or I think it's going to be tough. Uh, well, the third quarterback now can be on the practice squad. Yeah, and I don't know that, again, going back to the thing of, People have their own guys. A quarterback, particularly at cut down date, has to really be something for some for for another team to say, okay, I'm going to go get that because most teams have the same problem. The Jags. Yep. Do you carry three? You are probably not going to go sign a or claim a wavered player who wasn't the Jaguars two to come in and be your two. So now you've got to make room on your roster for a three that you don't know. I don't know that it's as much of a given that somebody snatches him up uh, as maybe fans think who are very enamored with the plays. Um, I, it, it's an equity decision for the Jaguars, meaning if you keep him, you're keeping him, yes, because you'd like to have him as your backup uh, potentially in a year or two, but you also think, well, quarterbacks are worth something in trade as well, which can matter. Uh, I think it's going to be tough for them to keep him as a three. Bottom line is he's getting it done on sheer athleticism, right? He, he is, he's got juice, and he's, that's the upside. The downside is he needs to now learn the system mm-hmm. and how this works. And so there is a learning curve for him. But there's optimism that if he's willing to apply himself and, and embrace the role of being three, that he can be a good two. And I know we love these, you know, random underdog, you know, Gardner Minshew, all those kinds of crazy plays and stories, but we have Trevor Lawrence. So hopefully no one yeah, other than him ever talking. touches the field. Well, we're gonna, is, what, after, is what I would hope. After this week, and, and by the way, I thought it was interesting today when Doug was asked, 
will C.J. Beathard play most of the second half on Saturday against the Dolphins, or will you work Rourke in? And he said, yeah, I haven't decided that yet. So, you know, we may see C.J. Beathard get the entire second half because those reps are going to be valuable for him. God willing, he doesn't play much, if Ever. at all, this year. Yes. But those reps are better served for your number two than your number three because your three is going to get a lot of reps on the practice field going forward. And remember, um, I don't know everything that will go into the decision. I don't. I don't know every detail of what Doug likes about C.J. Beathard, but Doug was a backup quarterback for a minute. Yeah. So he knows mm -hmm. what he wants from that role. And he was a three. And I think he, I think he wants to trust that role more than anything else. What am I going to see when that, you know, I've always said, a backup quarterback in the NFL, if your starter's out four weeks and you're a contender, you want that backup quarterback to be able to get you 500 during that yep. and keep you alive uh, and and trust that it's not going to be mistakes. It's not going to be mental stuff. Uh, so I'm sure Doug trusts CJ on that front or CJ wouldn't be here. By the way, last thought on this. Doug was not just a backup. Doug was a three in Miami, way down the depth chart behind Dan Marino, and he was released six times before he finally hooked on and became the three and then the two. Yeah, much so, more common to carry three in, in, in Doug's era than it is now. Although the, the practice squad now, because of the rules and how that's changed, allows you to do that. John, I know you went offense for your take as well. Well, I went offense, and my take's a little hotter than my feeling. This is the deepest nope, offense. No, you're going hot. Let's go hot take. This is the deepest offense in franchise history, and I think particularly at the skill positions. Is that Fred Taylor calling you right now? Um, Jimmy Smith? He's about deepest, to. not best. Um, <laughs> I don't think the running back rooms have necessarily had a, a Dearness Johnson at three You're right. at the same time that the tight ends went as deep. I, I feel like the offensive line is deep. Um, so this is not as much of a given as people think, but I think right now it, it is the deepest. Uh, what's impressive about the depth, and the point I wanted to get to with this take, I think Trent Baalke and the pro scouting people here need some credit. If you think about the depth right now, yes, it's coming from the draft. It's also coming from Dernis Johnson, Jeremiah Ledbetter, uh, Blake Hance, uh, Jacob Harris, guys that have been on other rosters. Young players who haven't. Well, Ledbetter's six. They signed Michael Dogby, who in his fourth year, they have really good third and fourth year players who have been elsewhere, who have a chance to either make an impact or be, you know, I don't know that this team has always had that in the past. I think there's an element that Trent felt uh, two years ago, like the roster was so depleted that you couldn't just build it through the draft. So they went with, I would even consider some of these guys third tier free agency. And now they have guys who, you know, it's hard to have a, a young defensive tackle, uh, Raymond Vahasek, I think I'm, I'm getting his name right, a rookie seventh-round pick, I think will be good. I don't know that he's ready right now to be good. Yeah. So in lieu of that, you have Jeremiah Ledbetter, who's a veteran who's good right now. Hard for rookies to be really good depth on your defensive line. So the Jaguars went out and got somebody like Jeremiah Ledbetter, who's not a rookie, but he's young, he's cap-friendly. Uh, that's roster building, and that's being ready. They've done a good job with this roster. I, I'll argue with you. In 98, they had Fred Taylor, James Stewart, and Tavian Banks. Um, I think the offensive line in 99 around here mm -hmm. was really deep and really good. But I think this is the deepest group of wide receivers they've ever had, and I think the deepest group of tight ends. And, and that counts you know, the 2006 season when they had Kyle Brady and Mercedes Lewis. Right, Lewis was a rookie. Yeah. And Brady was, you know, in his last season, was still the blessed blocking tight end and, and a good chain-moving third down. Um, I, you can make a strong argument that the talent level here in a year could easily be mm -hmm. right there. Yeah, and again, it's a, it, it, there's such a tendency to see the latest thing you saw. That's yeah. the best, you know. So I know there are position groups that have been better at times, but overall... I think the depth at receiver is what sort of tilts it for oh, me. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's the best. This group at its front line it, it is not Jimmy Keenan yet because you got to prove that. Right. Down to five or six, I think it's hard to find a deeper 
at, at any point in franchise. There's history. never been as many wide receivers here. And the reason I point out the running backs is I had a phone conversation with Davian Banks last week, and he was talking about that 98 room. And as a rookie, being able to learn from Fred and from Davian Davian could have been really good, man. Uh, yes. Yes, I was working on a story for the Alumni News on that one. It's, it's a great story. Great to catch up with him. All right, you guys, I'm going boiling hot. I didn't tell you what my take was yet, so you should be pleasantly surprised. I think the Jaguars are going to start the season 8-0. No. And I'm basing that wow. off of looking at the schedule. Obviously, Kansas City is going to be the first one we talk about. You know, that would be a franchise best. They've never I, started 8-0. No. You know what? Let's do this. We're going all in. I'm pushing all the chips in. We're They've doing never it. started 6-0. They have? No. Interesting. 5-0 is the best? There's been a 5-0 start, yes. All right. So hear me out. Coming from New England, I do not think it can be underestimated coming to Florida and playing in September because it affects people. I always believe that, and I always will believe that, having seen Tom Brady never be able to beat Miami in, in September games. It was his bugaboo. I believe that. I know Patrick Mahomes can do crazy things. But also, there's something else there we need to – Chris Jones has not reported to their training camp yet. We don't know if that's going to be figured out before the beginning of the season or not. He seems to be really have dug his heels in on that. And, you know, if you're losing the leading sack leader in the NFL, that's going to affect your defense. So that's my biggest bugaboo for them. After that, I think having two weeks in England will benefit them more than their opponents. And then – I think they'll go into the bye week undefeated at this point. Other than Kansas City, do you think there's any other games that you've looked at that are big for them in the first half of the season? Yeah, Buffalo is big. Um, yeah, uh, at Tottenham. At Tottenham, not in Buffalo in right. December. Uh, That's yeah. a huge out for them to it's not have to go one. to Buffalo, yeah. I think. If they do what you said, then I think they're going to the Super Bowl. Because if, to me, if you're 8-0 no against this schedule, you— Does 8-0 no get into the bye week? That's so you're the bye week. Beat, I think San Francisco is the first loss. That's the first game after the, the bye week at they home. Beat the Saints and then they. But beat I don't know the Steelers, if it does mean Super Bowl because road. if you have, then you come back. So the second half is really obviously Kansas City is a huge game, but the second half is what I'm looking at. Yeah. Is you've got 49ers, you've got the Bengals on Monday Night Football, you have Baltimore on Sunday Night Football, and then you get some of those weird bugaboo games like. Um, they're playing Carolina at home at Houston around Thanksgiving, and then Tennessee's the last game mm -hmm. of the season. So, but if you're eight and zero, you're really, really good, and you've got all of a sudden you've broken Kansas City's. So you have tiebreakers against Kansas City and Buffalo. Um, you're awfully hard to catch if you're eight and zero, and you've beaten two of the other good conference teams. Uh, I'm. I'm not going to have that hot a take. You guys got to come in. No Visualize really, it. We're making really, it happen. Really hard. So, 98, they started 5-0. and oh. Okay. And What did they finish? They finished 11-5. and five. Okay. Okay. And then they lost in the second round of the playoffs in New York. Uh, that was the Jets team led by um, Keyshawn Johnson and Curtis Martin that went on. No, Curtis Martin wasn't there that year. Um, that was the Testaverde year. Yeah, it was oh. Testaverde, and, and they went to the AFC title game and got beat that year by the Denver Broncos. And I'm just then now here's here's the best start in franchise history. Ready, 11, 13, and one, and that was um, that was '99 when they lost in Week Three to the Titans and then had an 11 game winning streak. So 11 and one is the best start. Five and zero oh is the best undefeated start. So I mean, your sister it can be done. More power to you. You guys, more power we have to, to talk you. this Throw into existence. Out well, let's go. Let's go. Yeah, that's John's a, not on board yet. I mean, John's I can't a little get more on cautious. Board with eight no, because eight no is really, really hard. And if you're starting eight no, eight no with this roster, you're elite. You're ready to join the big boys. You're one of the four, and uh, then you're flipping a coin in the playoffs whether you uh, beat one of the oh. elites. It means also that you win on Thursday night in New Orleans. And I know this is not the Drew Brees. That's my led. other second right. game I look at. Yeah. It's that Thursday night game is always tricky, especially on the road. And then Pittsburgh in Pittsburgh. Jaguars have had good success there in recent years. That's also a tough They're one. They're going to be good. Yeah. Yes. It'll be fun. We'll look more at the schedule a little bit uh, later on once we get through this last preseason game. But coming up, we'll talk to you guys about what we got going on this week. So stay with us. Jaguars fans, huddle up for the best defense against expensive car repairs, CarShield. Score big with the nation's number one automotive protection company, CarShield. They offer affordable plans that cover over 6,000 parts and systems in your car, truck, or SUV. Don't miss any Jaguars action this season with a car breakdown. Call the MVPs at CarShield for the best coverage ever. Call 800-471-1223. 800-471-1223. Go Jags! Since 2014, there's been only one official home builder of the Jaguars. 
DreamFinders Homes. With quality built homes and a speedy move in process, we're in 20 plus communities in the best locations across Northeast Florida. DreamFinders Homes is everywhere you want to live. So get off the sidelines, Jags fans, and get into the game. Let DreamFinders help you navigate your home purchase and offer great interest rates. Visit DreamFindersHomes.com for all your move in ready homes and step up your game. Crown Royals That Deserves a Crown program recognizes local heroes for making a positive impact in the community. The Jaguars and Crown Royal are giving back to those who serve this season, celebrating these individuals with the ultimate VIP Jaguars home game experience. Nominate someone who deserves a crown today at jaguars.com slash crown royal promotion. Please drink responsibly. Jags fans, if you want customized Jaguars furniture for your home, check out ZipChair.com to browse all customizable options. ZipChair is furniture for fans. So we have one more week of practice before preseason game three. Midday and late day practices, so they're getting out there in the sun, getting used to the weather. And we're just trying to make sure everybody stays healthy at this point, at least in my view. It's a big deal. Yeah, Yeah, one o'clock games here in week two against Kansas City and week three against Houston. So you better be ready for those days too. Well, it's interesting. This is sort of why, though, I think coaches like the idea of this sort of final buy of the preseason uh, because it gives you a chance to manage. Yes, the Jaguars are beat up, but there's also, what, 20 days until, until the, the game, first game the of the opener. Year. Well, if you were at week four and told Doug, hey, you're beat up, but you've got two bye weeks coming up, you know, to rest these guys, he'd be, okay, well, we can – we can manage that. So I think they're okay as long as they manage this and as long as nothing happens Sunday or uh, Saturday where you think, oh, there's another one. Right. And Doug said this morning that he, he's not going to coach fearful of injuries. It's football. It's a Good dangerous game. Because he can't do that. Guys get hurt. He's going to go out there and coach. He's got a certain uh, agenda plan for these guys, and he'll get that done. And if a guy gets hurt, a guy gets hurt. He, he, he's not going to coach scared. Last the bottom week, line is as long as the quarterback's up right yeah, that's it. Yes, and okay. last we heard, starters are going to go the whole first half yep. uh, against Miami. So we'll see a lot of what maybe this team can kind of put together in that time, give them a little time to work the offense, and we'll see what they got out there. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us. We'll come back with you on Wednesday for Jagzam and give you the latest on everything going down. <laughs> <laughs> 